live from the beautiful Virtual Jonas Center in Novato, California. KRCN is on the air and presents the Rotary Club of Novato Meeting Hour. Welcome, everybody. Today with Gary Brayman, past president Gary Brayman. We're going to hear a little bit more about Gary's life and his life in Rotary. And I want to thank you very much for joining us. Gary, let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? Wow, I was born in Salem, Oregon. And we lived in Oregon and Northern California just most of my growing up life. And then high school? High school, we went to Del Norte County High School in Crescent City, California. It's a population of uh, about a thousand kids in the school and there are about 14,000 people in, the, uh, in Crescent City, Del Norte County. Mm -hmm. Pretty small community. Our town was Smith River and there were 500 people, so pretty small. Sounds charming. And is that where you met Tony? Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, she was a junior in high school and I was a sophomore and I probably chased her around a little bit and she didn't <laughs> seem to say no most of the time. So right. I kind of got the best of the, la the lady that lived in, uh, in, in Fort Dick, California. And then you went to college? Went to Sacramento State College in Sacramento. Uh, pretty active in a fraternity there. Most of my member friends now are fraternity brothers that we've stayed in touch. Good. A lot of fun in high school and college. And then how me. did you make a living? Well, I was in the investment business oh. and uh, started in the insurance business in 1964 and for 56 years helped people with their finances and mm -hmm. wealth management. Very really good. a fun job for me. Very good. Well, it's wonderful when you can be that important a part of their lives, you know, and, and see it all come together. And these people are so neat to work with because they listen and they pay attention and sure. and uh, want to successfully retire. And by gosh, most of them did. So it's pretty neat. Fabulous. When did you uh, join Rotary and who sponsored you? I always like to know that. Well, thank you. Uh, our, our good friend Peter Fulcheron sponsored oh. me. Um, in 1986, I went to Europe, spent some time over there. We stayed in a really neat hotel, old hotel in France, and there was a Rotary meeting going on. And I kind of realized that if I was in Rotary, I could go to that meeting and <laughs> would have some friends there. And I, in 1987, as I came home, I joined the Nevada Rotary, which was awfully good experience for Tony and I. Oh, sure. Yeah, and then when, what year were you president? 1999-2000, and uh, we, had, we had lots of fun, did some silly things that, that year. I'm kind of remembering it's about April 1st right now, and we had one meeting that was an April Fool's meeting. And so we had people come, I called them a week ahead and said, I'd like you to tell us a story and let us know, uh, don't tell us whether it's a fake or not. <laughs> And I remember TJ said, yes, I was flying over the Rockies and all of a sudden the Blue Angels joined me. And uh, so I was flying with the Blue Angels. And of course that was false, but <laughs> people had to vote whether it was false or not. What and, a great uh, That was kind idea. of a fun meeting. I remember that one. Great idea. Yeah, educate. you do the scholarship committee. Uh, and have for years, is that correct? Certainly with others, mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of people that work awfully hard. We could name them, but they're working hard. But we gave $70,000 of scholarships last year, and it's going to be probably in the range of 72 or 3 this year. That's quite a bit of money, 24 scholarships. Pretty that, impressed with that number. That's great. And then the other thing is the teacher recognition that I, I think of you when I when you do the teacher recognition once a year, right? So in 1999, uh, there, was a, there was a superintendent of schools that was assigned here by our school board, of course, and his job was to cut back teacher salaries and oh. get them to retire and cut costs. He was doing a real good job. He happened to be a Rotarian. He was doing what his job was. But as I had clients come in, I had eight or 10 school teachers that were really unhappy and uh, I asked Dave Jones to run that program. He did a beautiful job, and it's going to be the 20th year this year. So, uh, uh, that's really important to us. 
to me anyway. Yes, yes, fabulous. One of my favorite things about Teacher Recognition Day is when you line them all up on the stage and you make them take the pledge that they will promise to yeah. Recite the pledge for me and for well, our audience. I don't think I can recite it, but it was Frank <laughs> Bruno's idea, I believe. And they had him raise their right hand and say that they were going to spin it for themselves and not for students and not for anybody else. And so if they were a lady, they could go have their nails done or a man, they could go fishing. Right. And uh, pretty, pretty neatly done. And a big smile and occurs. Always then. a yeah. big chuckle. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's my favorite meeting, really. Gary, when you look back at uh, how far you've come from Smith River, California, way up north there, who, who were the most significant mentors that you had in your life? Well, somewhere along, along the line, I think it was my father, he said, you know, as you walk through life, you need to always have a mentor. And wherever you are, you need a mentor. So there were a group of them. Certainly real early in my life, it was my high school coach. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a speech teacher. I remember his name, first name was Red. And he uh, was a mentor of mine. But as I followed through the investment business, there were people that were good at what they did. And I always wanted to look at them and ask them questions. Yes. But you know, if you go to somebody and ask for help, do you know what really happens? They help you. Funny and so they thing. became your mentors. Yes. Now, as I'm almost 80 years old, it's a little harder to find mentors, but you got people like Alan Gulo at 92 that's a mentor. Sure. We've got lots of mentors. One last question, Gary. This has been terrific. What's most important to you in life? Well, we've all got 15 or 20 years to go, and I think we need to raise a, continue to raise a good family that we need to make sure that they are, are good enough to make a good money, that they work hard and they live good. And I want that just to continue to grow as a family unit through my next 20 or 30 years. And you have two sons? I have a daughter and, oh, a, daughter son. and a son. Daughter's a school teacher. Good. And the son works at Trader Joe's. And uh, they have four children, all doing great. Good. Wonderful. Well, thank you very, very much, and thank you to our audience, and we look forward to our next Marty's Moment. And in the meantime, you may be next. So uh, um, today I'm introducing uh, Duncan McSwain, which most of you have uh, seen coming to the meetings. And for, he has been for the past few years, a true friend to me, someone uh, with a kind heart who cares for the world and the people in it. <laughs> Early in his life, uh, Duncan earned uh, the rank of captain in the military. He won, uh, one of the highlights during this period, he uh, commanded a counterintelligence unit, taught counterinsurgency for foreign undercover agents at the Psychological Warfare Center in North Carolina and wrote the correspondent course in psychological warfare. Duncan has also been a career educator. He taught at Redwood High School for 32 years and was named Marin County Teacher of the Year. He was nominated for the National Science Teacher of the Year Award and he was Northern California Cross Country Coach of the Year while leading his own children to be exceptional athletes. He raises fund, uh, funds for charities, particularly when weather events occur in countries he has visited. During, uh, Duncan's had, Duncan has traveled extensively over 80 countries. Um, Duncan's photographs from his over 30 years of travel are all categorized and many have been published in 15 countries. His retirement has given him the opportunity to continue to teach. In this instance, photography to his neighbors, neighbors at Marine, Marinewood Community Center. Each week, he publishes an email note called Travel Bites. Interesting notes of his countless travels with an exemplar picture to illustrate. On that note, Duncan 
will talk about photography in Amazon. And he will show us his amazing pictures, many of them taken in the jungle at night. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Renee, for those nice words. I don't know if you've been to the Amazon. Some people have. Most people haven't. They think of it as dark, wet snakes and mosquitoes. And that's right. But there's a lot more to it than that. I've been very fortunate to have traveled to uh, jungles in Borneo, Papua New Guinea, Panama, throughout the Amazon and Brazil, Suriname, Peru and Ecuador and other places as well. But my favorite place has turned out to be the Amazon in Peru. And I have been there seven times. So I'd like to share with you a few, just a few images from things I've been able to find and encourage you, if you don't mind the mosquitoes and the wetness and so forth, to rather than just read about the Amazon, go and live it and go to a lodge and explore it and you will open a whole new chapter in your adventure life. So let's see, with Renee's help, I hope I've been able to put something together. Yes, it looks like I can. So anyway, we're just gonna go to the Amazon in Peru and let's see what happens. If we follow what Renee has instructed me to do. There we go. First of all, there are monkeys. And there, where we go in the Amazon, in one, no, oh, in the lodge, there are 16 different kinds of monkeys. So they're quite easily found. This is a howler monkey. And uh, they're not too aggressive. Most uh, monkeys aren't aggressive, but if they are, uh, they can bite and there's a bit of a problem. This is a pygmy marmoset. They're about the size of a tennis ball. And you see them scurrying about on the trees and so forth. They're very shy, very curious. And to, if you can imagine a monkey the size of a tennis ball that will fit in the palm of your hand, they're very precious. This is an owl monkey. They're shy and they're a bit aggressive and they live in trees. And what, how perfectly named an owl monkey. The tamarind. There are many different kinds of tamarinds. And here we have a, um, <laughs> Not a spider monkey, I keep thinking this is a spider monkey, but it's not. Curious, monkeys are curious. And this also is in trees. And this is, and you won't find this on the ground and it doesn't sound very pleasant. It's a yellow crowned brush trailed tree rat. It's about a foot long. One amazing thing about the Amazon if you're quiet and if you let the animals and the wildlife and the sounds and smells come to you, it's an amazing experience. This is a giant river otter. They get up to be about six and sometimes six and a half feet long. They are big and they have impressive teeth and they're curious and you can hear them chattering and so forth in family groups. And you're all familiar with the sloth. You can tell this is a male because of the bright orange on its back. They don't move very fast, but they're very agile. Let's go to birds. This is a yellow rumped cacique, kind of about, about the size of a crow, a bit loud, beautiful. I was able to take these pictures because once I started going to uh, Peru, I started using a point and shoot camera, which has a lens of 1,365, 
magnification. So I can get very close to these birds like this uh, nun bird. This trupial, this should be out at Halloween, right? Amazing color, a trupial. And a wire-tailed mannequin. Now we don't have these birds here in Marin and they're only found deep in the forest and they're very shy, but they have to be found for mating purposes and so forth. So they are brightly colored. How do we know that a bird can see color? Because it does have color. Mammals for the most part do not see color. So we find that mammals don't have color. They have patterns and shades, but they don't see color the way we do. This is a, <coughs> a cuckoo, a black-billed cuckoo. And this is a bird that has just stuck its toe in an electric socket. Looks like it, doesn't it? It's a Watson, it's about the size of a turkey. And it does look like it's just had a shock of some kind. They're great. They smell awful because they eat vegetation, the vegetation stays in their body and, and ferments and so forth. So sometimes you find a Watson by the odor. This is a great patu, very hard to find. <clears throat> I have a series that we don't have time to look at, but you can look at this limb from down below and not even see a thing. But with a lens of over a thousand uh, magnification, we can pick it up. It's very quiet. It's related to frog mouths. And it will call at, now, at night. It's so loud. It sounds like a tree coming through a tunnel. The bird on the right is a fork-tailed flycatcher. And this is not a close-up at all, but I love this picture. And that's a kiskadee on the left. This is a wood, creep, a wood creeper I found at night. And it was in its nest, which is inside of a tree. Very interesting, very fortunate to find something like this at night. Amazing discovery, discoveries can be made at night. This is a kiskadee. And of course, there are a lot of birds of prey. This is a slate colored hawk. and a black caracara. Looks like it should be a statue of some kind. This is a yellow-headed caracara in a rainstorm. A black-throated hawk. I love this. It's a fluorescent tiger heron. And it just, it's about the size of our black crown night herons that we have here in Marin. But we don't have anything with this stunning color. Look at that weapon. Can you imagine having something like that? And of course, that's how it gets its food. But that's really impressive. The eyes, look at those orange eyes. And of course, the patterns on the feathers. This is a black capped or a capped heron, another beautiful water bird. Here it is again on the top of a tree, a capped heron. And this is a striated heron. And if you look carefully under its eyes, you'll see mosquitoes. Mosquitoes need uh, more than blood, they need moisture. But there's also a good source of blood right under the eye of this capped heron. I watched it carefully as, <coughs> excuse me, it was looking for fish and it succeeded. That's a big something to swallow. But of course it did, and I have a whole series of that. Here's another striated ha uh, heron in the evening at dusk. This 
This is a white-eared hakamar, about the size of a uh, kingfisher. I love this in the next photo. Of course, we have egrets here in Marin, and if you've been out to the ponds at all in McGinnis, you've seen them, or just about anywhere we have water, but there's an elegance to this. And we have egrets also in the Amazon in quiet waters. This is if it's saying, what are you doing here? This is my territory. A great egret. And sometimes birds get together. These are large beaked uh, terns and uh, cormorants on a tree. So it's great to go out at night and in areas like in, in Central America, like Costa Rica, we go out looking for poison dart frogs. Poison dart frogs have bright colors <coughs> and they can be diurnal day frogs because they're poison. No one will bother them. The tree frogs have to be out at night. They're very secretive. So this is a tree frog. This is a tree frog posing for us. And some are so small. Can you see this? It's a little grass frog. It's about half an inch long. And it's calling out to attract a mate. You can see its eyes. Here's another grass frog. This one, instead of being green, is orange. There are some poison dart frogs in the Amazon, this being one. When you handle these, to, they get all kinds of debris on their skin and you have to wash it off to take a picture, but then you have to be sure and wash your hands in a stream afterwards because uh, some of the skin secretes poison and so forth. This is hard to see and very typical. Can you see the toad right in the middle there? It just blends in so well. Some don't. This is uh, the Amazon's ugliest toad, and it's just waiting there for you. And this was taken at night. You don't see these during the day. It's about three inches long. Bats, all kinds of bats. This is a proboscis bat, and they hang on the underside of trees over water <coughs> during the day. And this is a um, possum and it's hiding out in a termite nest that it's using as a nest. And you see the white strip there, that's the forehead and you can two, see two little black dots, those are its eyes. And again, it's impossible and fortunate to see so many things in the Amazon which are available if you have the time to do it. This is going out at night and finding a black caiman. This is a young one in a pond. These caiman can get up to be 15 and 18 feet long. It's a little nicer and more fun to challenge the little ones. This is just a grass lizard, but look at those talents. You have to be careful when you're walking. I almost stepped on this boa. So watch your step. This was uh, one thing that I was fortunate to watch, to see. This was going out at night and this is a fertilance. A fertilance is a very poisonous snake. And when we go out at night, we always wear rubber boots that go to mid calf or almost up to our knees. One, because it's always so wet but also should there be an unfortunate encounter with something like this that provides some protection. This is a little vine snake, but again, look at those mosquitoes looking for moisture. This is the ugliest uh, lizard in the Amazon. This is a caiman lizard. And it's, a, it's large like iguanas, but it, uh, it's an amazing, look at those, that pebbled skin. 
Let's go to insects a little bit. Amazing insects, <coughs> millions of different kinds, perhaps. This is about an inch and a half long, impressive jaws. Some are hidden very well. Can you see this? It's a stick insect. And it's half of its body is on the brown leaf in the upper left. And it's stretching out and pointing toward the yellow leaf on the lower right. A walking stick or a stick insect. Here's another, a bark mantis. This was such an amazing discovery the first time I saw one. It is totally camouflaged. And I got up very close on this so you can see it. And you can see it a little better this way when I go from a side view. Katie did, matching perfectly with leaves, again at night. An iridescent insect that just, you know, is like out of a picture book. Look at those two black marks on the back, which would confuse a predator, a predator thinking those were eyes. <coughs> this is a wax-tailed, leaf hopper and that wax serves as a protective uh, confusing and, and uh, gooey substance to keep it protected from predators. Lots of times we can find tarantulas that are quite big they're fascinating this is a pink toed tarantula you can see why and when I saw this uh, particular spider two years ago, it was amazing. It's a fish eating spider. And will go down and disturb the surface of a small quiet pond. And that disturbance will attract small fish It will catch those fish and eat them. I had never heard of a fish eating spider before. Butterflies are everywhere and are beautiful. And this last butterfly picture was taken before uh, the pandemic. And they gather quite closely looking for minerals and moisture. And you'll notice there are three different kinds of butterflies here. Essentially all the same with, with minor differences. This is a pre-butterfly. Some of the caterpillars are stunning. Look at the brush on the back. And very briefly, as we come to an end, as my time is running out, this is the lodge where we stay. We fly into Iquitos, then go four hours up river, up a tributary to this area. There are no roads. Kids go to school by canoe and it is deep in the Amazon. This is the tributary leading to the lodge and there's a boat there that you can see. And the water is just mirror smooth. If you read uh, Teddy Roosevelt's River of Doubt, you know of the, of the uh, you know, difficulties of traveling in the Amazon with all kinds of stuff. They had to do all kinds of portages and so forth. That's not the case when you go up into these tributaries. This is the first scene you see when we leave the lodge, when we step down from the porch, get on and out on a boat and take off. Sometimes there are, the pathways are uh, above water. Most of the time they're too wet. It's a wonderful place to visit. And on this, I'm the one on the right and uh, it, the sloth is on the left. Okay, that will cover it. And I think I, oh, 
I'm still here. Okay, that's it. Thank you for looking at that. And I hope someday you'll be able to go to the uh, to the Amazon yourself and just really appreciate a very, very magic place. And I am where am I? Okay. Are we on? Ah. Okay, Renee, I don't know where to go now. Question? Okay, there we go. Uh, uh, I think Gary uh, had a question. Uh, Gary, you want to uh, go first, please? You're going to have to unmute Gary. Beautiful, and we'd see some of these before. You, you have travel bites that you've done for about 275 weeks consistently. Would you tell what you do there? And it's fascinating to me, and I've the been added to your list. Thank you. The travel bites are merely a little vignette and story about travel experiences I've had or photo hints that you might have when you uh, go on your own travels and way to enhance your own experience as well as taking photos that you might share with other people when you, uh, when you return. And it's a way to stay in touch with a lot of people that I've known over the years that have been on my trips that I've led or former students or former photography students or even people in other countries that I've come to know. So it's a real nice way to stay in touch with a lot of people in a way that they don't have to feel they have to respond. They can say, yeah, we're in touch and we're still part of an expanded family and thanks for getting in touch. And, and how does someone sign up for that uh, travel bite? Uh, if you would like to see it or any, send me an email and I'll put you on uh, one. They come out every Monday. And this coming Monday is a picture of three wild donkeys in the salt flats of the Torres del Paine National Park in Chile. And it's a facial standoff. I want to do something. They're looking at me as if, what are you doing here? This is our place. So it's, it's just kind of a fun little thing. There's short and there's a picture. And if you want to reach me, my email is D like in Duncan, M A C S number 11 at iCloud.com. D Max 11 at iCloud.com. Just say, send me a note and say, hi, we met at uh, the Nevada Rotary. I'd like to uh, see your, an example of your travel bikes. And I won't burden you with the Great, 250 you. you've missed. Thank you for looking at these pictures uh, this afternoon. A yeah. very special place. Don, Don Violin, you had a question? Yes, uh, please. Uh, thank you for your very interesting uh, bunch of pictures and animals and everything else. Uh, my question has to do with how did you enter the, the Amazon? Did you come from uh, Brazil? On Peru, to go to Peru, you fly to Iquitos, which is 2,400 miles upriver. And then from Iquitos, you take a speedboat four hours up river, up a tributary. Oh, okay. Thank you. And you go Lima, Iquitos, and then on. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, uh, Fred Anderson, you wanna unmute and go ahead. Yeah, uh, Duncan, what, uh, which camera do you use for the, uh, for the point and shoot? I use a Canon, I really like it. And it's a Canon, they're not expensive. They're only about $500. I used to have some very fancy Nikon equipment, particularly a macro lenses and a 300 millimeter <coughs> lens with an extender. And I'd find I'd be lying in the mud waiting for a dragonfly to come back to a leaf with 12 pounds of equipment on my back. 
And I thought, this is nuts. I do it because I enjoy it and for fun, not because I'm going to get anything in National Geographic. So I got rid of all that fancy, heavy stuff. And I'm so happy with this one camera that has all of these capabilities and it's not so expensive. I remember one time in India, I had to spend all my time protecting the camera because it was so crowded and the camera lens was so long. It was a nuisance really. So anyway, this is very nice and it's a Canon and they have point and shoots that are for my purposes and just for enjoyment and do without worry, tripod? fantastic. Do you use a tripod or do you use flash at night? I've carried a tripod and it's just more equipment. I'll use a sandbag sometimes or I'll use the base of a tree or I'll put the necklace, the uh, strap around my neck and use that as a brace. That also works. Hey, uh, other questions for uh, Duncan? Thank you again, it was great. I, I, I don't see any, thank you, Duncan. It was a great presentation and uh, thank you for enlightening, enlightening us about the the Amazon and your travels. We really appreciate it. And we hope that you'll continue to visit us and uh, consider becoming a member uh, one day. So thanks again.